challenge it. And when that I started, they were at a 98. So almost by half. Yeah. Amen. Amen. All right. And then we had, I think we mentioned it Sunday, uh, but I had written it in. I will try to get it fixed on, on the request online. I emailed it to everybody I have an email for. I don't remember if I sent it to H. Cox or not. But uh, Gerald Augustine is up and walking. So, um, that is, considering he had been here in care at Limestool for several weeks and had not done that, and it was just a minor surgery, that's pretty amazing. Still praying for baby Oakland, Sham? Well, I have an update. On? Gerald Augustine, I talked to Fabia, and she said he's been discharged from the hospital. Wow, so when do they expect to be back? Uh, next year, sorry, I'll, uh, Sunday or next Sunday, like in a week, they expect to be back. Well, that's even better news. I think we can just go ahead and take him off the list. Amen. That's am isn't that amazing? That's what your prayers do. Amen. We're praying for Jen's friend, excuse me, Sham's friend, Jen, in Oklahoma. Taking, I read that backwards. I was trying to read it right. Uh, taking custody of some small children. I wish you were the only one in the country doing that. Uh, but at least in the states, that seems to be an epidemic of parents who refuse to be parents. And, uh, grandparents and so forth. I used to say, because of some personal experience with a couple of different families, that uh, the people who did the worst job the first go get to do it again. <laughs> so they can, And most of them were doing even more poorly the second go than the first go. But I have seen several exceptions to that where some people who have never even been parents are taking these children and trying to do something with it. So uh, that kind of plays into what we've been praying about, about the revival. And then Sham's other friend, the Weber family, dealing with an aging dad and some difficulties there. Uh, any news on Palatka and Southside Baptist? The last I heard, there have been 27 saved and um, they are continuing to see the revival itself is over but they're continuing to see people saved on sunday they had um over 300 in church and, and what was the what was say say three months ago what was the attendance about 150. so it's nearly doubled inside and yeah, 27 saved see we need to keep praying uh still praying from monroe county mississippi uh, Stefan is supposed to go to Tanzania for, I think he said three weeks just coming up. I think we could take storms in Texas off. Then again, we probably need to leave that on until about June. <laughs> but a couple of different things Miss Denise and I talked about. Um, we have 16 window boxes on the outside. 20. How you figure 20? Because I went around the building and counted them. Well, I counted the windows. You got more than one in one window? There's some windows that are no longer windows with window boxes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So anyway, what I was going to say is we had 24. Apparently, there might be 26 um, boxes or hanging. We have eight hanging out here. And whatever we bought to hang was bought before I got here last year. And they were clearly perennials, which meant no annuals which means you have to do it again so we thought if any everybody didn't have plans on friday night we could have a planting party and we could each person bring enough flowers for one or two boxes and maybe we can at least do the one side and get some hangings and if if we're lucky maybe we can do it all like i know the clarks are going to be out of town so i don't know how many that we will have but we could Maybe pick up some pizza over at the shop. Ed, I think that's the I best think we pizza. Have, I think we have enough sample stuff. I'll have to figure out. You think? We'll have something for me. So Denise says we'll have something. It will be Denise. really simple. <laughs> okay. And then we can also, since we have some fellowships coming up, we can clean out the, uh, maybe while the women do the planting, we can take all the uh, picnic tables out from under the, uh, pavilion and sweep it out and there's a riser in there well we don't need the riser in there we'll work on that so if everybody is in agreement what time 
setting the clock. Some of us don't get off work till six, so maybe we can do 6.30, it's about the earliest we can manage, I think. We'll plan on that. I don't, any complaints, any no way, no how? All right, so this Friday, we're gonna try to do something with the planners and stuff. Anybody else? I have a phrase, nobody knows it but us, but <clears throat> it's not something we were praying for, but Katie put on Facebook, she was so excited because her little one, uh, had a peanut allergy and I guess she was praying that the Lord would take it away and the doctor said very 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 unlikely and they went back and had her tested she's two now and she doesn't have peanut allergies and she said see what God can do Katie is our other daughter she's not really our daughter but Denise homeschooled her when she was in high school and so she calls us her other parents and, uh, anyway she's married now obviously and has a two-year-old but that is a phrase. Anybody else? Uh, I have a phrase. Okay. Um, I talked to my mom last night, and um, she has she's made the decision that she's still going to take her medication and things like that, but she had lots of doctors telling her, well, eat this, but don't eat that, and another doctor would tell her the opposite and stuff, trying to get her body levels under control. And she said, I'm done. I'm just going to eat what I want to eat. I'm going to make the best judgments I can based on how I'm feeling. And she's done that. And she went back to the doctor and had her blood work done and tests done. And all of her levels are normal for the first time in 20 years. Well, amen. And, and so it's just, it's, they it's, do it's great. They do practice medicine. Yes. Anybody else? Going once. Going twice. Brother Otis, would you lead us in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, for the night, we thank you for bringing us here. We thank you for being the God that we mercy and do us now, dear Lord. We do all of these things for the glory of Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask you to bless the clergy tonight. We ask you to bless the, the preacher and let his word be, be heard in our, in our hearts and in our minds, Lord. And let us go forth and tell not only Amen. The ladies are going to lead you in some songs. The preacher has a headache. He's going to get some of that to drink. This is page 339 in the Majesty Hymnal. 
chapter 7 tonight. Didn't they do a good job? Yes, they did. Yeah. As always, we appreciate their hard work. We Last week we covered John chapter 6. We're trying to make it through uh, the Gospel of John. And every chapter to me is, is enjoying, enjoy, uh, enjoyable. Because it shows us a couple of things. Obviously it shows us the power of our Savior. You know, last week we read about the feeding of the 5,000 and and so forth, and uh, walking on the water, and just his amazingness. It, it shows us his doctrine, what he actually himself preached. And then it also shows us the reaction he got. You know, I think sometimes when, when we're in ministry, I know myself, I have to be honest, I get frustrated at times when when I teach something or I preach something and whether it be a lost person that needs the Lord or a saved person that needs to grow, when they don't get it, you know, sometimes I'm like, you pastor, before you understand this, I'm like, it's so clear. Why don't you get this? You know? Um, <clears throat> but we'll see tonight that he had those same things. And then, you know, when you're in ministry, maybe as much and possibly even more than some other field of endeavor, uh, people want to question, you know, uh, and, and we see here in tonight's text that even the Lord suffered questions. We see there is a text that a prophet is not without honor except in his own country. As we read tonight, we're going to see that Christ's own siblings said, question, they did not believe him, at least at this point in time, and they did not uh you know, they question him, and you know it. You know how siblings are. I mean, I have one sister. There are at least one, there's at least one person in the room that knows my sister. And, you know, when she thinks she's right, she, she can be, uh, she'll put you where you need to be, all right? And if she's wrong, she still may try to put you where you need to be. Uh, and I, I didn't have a brother, so I don't know how that works, but I'm guessing Nathan could tell you how having two older brothers works. Uh, you've got several brothers. Um, I would venture to say uh, that my wife could tell you what it's like to have a sister and how difficult that can be. All right? it, it is. This is another thing we as humans do is we, we take our own upbringing and we kind of compare it whether we mean to or not, to everybody else's, and we don't understand why they, why their house isn't like our house. But you know, I, I met uh, just randomly met a, a couple who had three daughters and a son. And just to explain, my I have three sons and a daughter. Emma came along, and Emma's just Emma's just Emma. Emma's a blessing. She lives up her, to her name, Emma Joy. She typically makes people happy. She likes to make people happy. She often sees a job and just does it. Does it. Now her brothers will generally do anything I ask them to do, but they're like their father. Denise says to me, I don't understand. I say, you tell me and I'll do it. And she's like, well, don't you just see what needs to be done? Well, no, I don't, I don't necessarily see what needs to be done. So she tells me, I'll do it. And that's the way my boys are. Emma often, like her mother, just sees what needs to be done and, and does it without being asked. Uh, with this other family I met that had three girls and a boy, in their house, it was the opposite. The girls would do anything their mother asked them to do, but the boy just saw stuff that needed, like he said, the trash is full. Well, he tied it up, take it out. Every house is different. And yet, with mankind, lots of things are the same. It's kind of a lengthy chapter, but we are going to try to cover it all. We don't have anybody to read German. Do you have a German Bible, uh, Otis? Nope. So we don't have anybody to read German. We don't have anybody to read Romanian. I am going to read the whole chapter. Let's read. <clears throat> After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee for, or because, he would not walk in Jewry because the Jews sought to kill him. Now, the Jews' feast of the John. tabernacle. John. He didn't say what chapter. John chapter 7. I said it to start with, but I'll say it again. John chapter 7. 
We covered six last week. Everybody in John chapter 7? Yes, sir. All right, we'll start again. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewelry, because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews, feast of the tabernacle, was at hand. His brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence, and go up into Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. For neither did his brethren believe on him, believe in him. So basically what they're saying, well, you say that you're the Savior, you say that you've come to change the world, why are you hiding? If you're all you say you are, you go out there and show them. All right, I'm sure it wasn't real pleasant. And then we get here in verse uh, 6. Jesus said unto them, my time's not yet come. But your time is always ready. In other words, it's not time for everybody to know who I am, but you could, you could believe on me right now. Your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hated me because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. Go ye up unto this fast. I go up yet unto this fast. I go not up yet unto this fast, for my time is not yet full come. So he didn't say he wasn't going. He said, I'm not going right now. Verse number nine. When he had said these words unto them, he abode still in Galilee. But when his brethren were gone up, then went he also up to the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. Then the Jews saw him at the feast and said, Where is he? And there was much murmur among the people concerning him. For some said, He's a good man. Others said, Nay, but he deceiveth the people. Howbeit no man spake openly of him for fear of the Jews. Now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? And Jesus answered them, said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know the doctrine, whether it be of God. And whether I speak of myself, he that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory. But he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true. And no unrighteousness is in him. Did not Moses give you the law? And yet none of you keepeth the law. Why go you about to kill me? The people answered and said, Thou hast the devil. Who goeth about to kill thee? Jesus answered and said unto them, I have done one word, and ye all marvel. Moses therefore gave unto you the circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers, and ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. If a man on the Sabbath day receive circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, are ye angry at me because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. What does that mean right there? We're going to take a rabbit trail, and we'll get back to the preaching and to the reading of it in a second. This is not in the sermon notes, but he said, judge or righteous judgment. What's he, what's he saying right there? Judge according to the God of word, uh, the word of God and, and holding people accountable. So them. don't we hear people all the time? Don't you judge me. Only, I've seen people with tattoos on their necks with praying hand that says only God can judge me. Judge not that you be not judged is so often taken out of context. The true context of it is if you do something and it's not right, it is just for me to say the Bible's against that. Right. But if I say, <laughs> I'm going to step on some toes right here. Maybe of nobody, maybe not of you, you present, but of people I know. Well, he said this, but what he really meant was <laughs> that is what Christ was saying not to do. Because you really don't know why Somebody did something. Because you and me, our last name's not Christ. We can't see into somebody's heart as to why they did this or did the other or failed to do the other. 
That's what he's talking about. Judge righteous judgment is exactly what Sham says. It is judging things according to the word of God. Judge not that you be not judged, again, is taking and trying to say why someone did something. There's absolutely nothing wrong to say that is wrong if we have chapter and verse for it. It is right that you, if you have chapter and verse for it. That's what he's talking about. Judge righteous judgment. Let's pick up right there. Then said some of them of Jerusalem, Is not this he whom they seek to kill? But lo, he speaketh boldly. And they say nothing unto him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ? How be it? We know this man whence he is, but when Christ cometh, no man knoweth whence he is. Then cried Jesus in the temple as he taught, You both know me, and you know whence I am. I am not come of myself, but he that sent me is true, whom ye know not. But I know him, for I am from him, and he hath sent me. In other words, all these people are milling about in the temple and quote-unquote worshiping, and he lifted up his voice and said loudly that they didn't really know what they were worshiping, mm -hmm. that they didn't really know God. Verse 30, then they sought to take him, but no man laid hold, hold on him because his hour is not yet come. In other words, God protected him because it wasn't time for him to be crucified. Verse 31, and many of the people believed on him and said, when Christ cometh, Will he do more miracles than these which this man hath done? The Pharisees heard that the people murmured such things concerning him, and the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. Then said Jesus unto them, Yet a little while, and I am with you, and then I go unto him that sent me. Ye shall seek me, and shall not find me, and where I am thither you cannot come. Then said the Jews among themselves, Whither will he go that we shall not find him? Will he go unto the dispersed among the Gentiles and teach the Gentiles? What manner of saying is this that he said, Ye shall seek me and shall not find me, and where I am to thee cannot come? In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture says, hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit. Notice that's capitalized. Which they believed, which they that believed on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said, Of oh, the truth, this is the prophet. Others said, This is the Christ. But some said, Some said, Shall Christ come out of Galilee? Hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? So there was a division among the people because of him. And some said, some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto them, Why have ye not brought him? The officers answered, Never man spake like this man. Then answered them the Pharisees, Are ye also deceived? In other words, the Pharisees said to the cops, I'm going to call them, Are you are you deceived as well? Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed on him? But this people who knoweth not the law are cursed, Nicodemus saith unto them. He that came to Jesus by night being one of them, doth our law judge any man before it hear him? And know what he doeth? They answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophecy. And every man went unto his own house. I'm going to give you five points, and I'm going to explain them to you, and we're going to go to house. Questions. We started out kind of talking about it. Even Jesus' own family questioned his actions, they questioned his motives. What are you about? They themselves did not believe on him, which I already quoted to Matthew 13, 57. The prophet's not without honor, honor except in his own country. In other words, the family and friends that we've known the longest time sometimes have the hardest time believing our preaching and our witness. 
Hmm. Now, I love it when I hear testimonies. I wish I had a translator here so that Cosman could hear what I'm saying. But he told me 20 years ago, he went to Spain. And while he was in Spain, his brother got saved and baptized in a Baptist church. And when he got back and he saw the change in his brother, he, he followed the Lord. That's what we're looking for. But it is quite common for our brethren to question us. So Jesus' family questioned him. The Pharisees questioned him. These are in verses 8 to 24. You had questions for the Pharisees. The people asked, hey, if they want to kill him, why is he in the temple teaching? The people asked why uh, they were not going about to kill him. The people asked, do they even know that he is the Christ? Then he had questions by the Pharisees. They accused Christ. We've already read it, so I'm not going to go back to it. They accused him of being possessed by a devil. They asked him who was going about to kill him, even though they knew they were the ones going about trying to figure out how to kill him. All right, so you have the questions by the family, by the Pharisees. You have the crowds. The crowds then wondered if the leaders actually knew Jesus was the Christ. And yet they didn't believe their own hypothesis because they knew that Jesus was from Bethlehem, excuse me, was from Galilee, and they had somehow forgotten that he was born in Bethlehem. So, you know, the crowds are like confused. And, and the same thing's going to happen when we witness. Some people are going to grab it, some people are going to be confused by it. Uh, <clears throat> then you have the cops. The Pharisees sent officers to arrest him. Uh, the, uh, he spoke to them of his departure to heaven. But they didn't get it. They had eyes that didn't see and ears that didn't hear. In, in verses 37 to 39, he talks about, uh, well, before I tell you, what's the, what's the number one rule for understanding the scripture, Philip Wayne Sibley? Putting you on the spot. It's the number one rule for understanding scripture. Knowing Jesus? Well, that's part of it. Amen. <laughs> the scripture does say that it is spiritually discerned. But context, context, context. Those are the three rules for understanding scriptures. Context, context, context. What does context mean? The prefix con means with. So the verses are around what we're talking about. Okay? The verses. In other words, if you try to misinterpret scripture, scripture will tell somebody you've misinterpreted it. Years and years ago, my dad had three women come to the door, and they were quoting scripture to him, and he said, you're using that out of context. Oh, it's the Bible. You can't use it out of context. And they went to another, and he said, now, that's not what that verse is saying. What that verse is saying is, it's all the Bible. You can't take it out of context. This went on for about half an hour, and finally my dad said, you're telling me that I can quote you any verse of the Bible, and you have to obey it. You have to know my daddy. He had to be already grinning. <laughs> they said, yep, that's right. He said, Judas went out and hung himself. Go and do thou likewise, and that thou doest do quickly. You can take the scripture out of context. <laughs> Took you a second to get that, didn't you? All right? You can't take the, the, the key to understanding scripture is scripture and the very next verse explains to us that he's talking about the Holy Spirit. Okay? He's talking about the Spirit. But they didn't get this. Alright? The cops go back and talk to the to the uh, Pharisees that sent them. But well, why didn't you arrest him? Nobody ever spoke like that. So then you have these schisms. You have the schisms among the Pharisees. Now, we have probably, if we're honest, we have probably been guilty of what Nicodemus did. Nicodemus tried to make a stand without actually making a stand. He tried to point them to Christ, to use the law to them, but he never actually said, hey, I, I do believe. Right? It's very... It's very unoffensive and unfruitful witness at that moment, right? Now, who knows what the Lord used from there on out, but even Nicodemus, who had believed on him, did not give a proper witness. 
So some of the people believed, some of the people wanted to believe, and they argued with themselves. This is the same thing that happened when Peter preached. This is the same thing that happened when Stephen preached. This is the same thing that happened when Paul preached. And with Paul, with, with, with Peter, you just have to use your logic. It doesn't talk about the ones who didn't receive it or the ones that said we'll hear it again later. It just says 3,000 people believed and were baptized and were added to the church in Acts chapter 2. But there were th multiply thousands of people present when he was preaching. We know a couple of chapters later, five more thousand men. It specifically says men. So then that leads us to believe that there were women and children who also got saved. So it's kind of logic there. With Stephen, I'm going to say it's logic. Who held the coats of the men who stoned Stephen? Paul. Paul held the coats. Did Paul get saved that day? Was he under conviction? Very likely. Sometimes we're under conviction, and we don't want anybody to know we're under conviction. Mm -hmm. I was saved July 13th, 1978, but as a mid, in my mid to late 20s, I was under conviction that I wasn't living right, and the Lord wanted me to turn my life back to Him. And I was that guy that was holding on to the pew and my knuckles were turning white. And I knew Dr. Bobby Cobb would quit at 12 o'clock. And by 12.05, I could be half a mile down the road smoking a Marlboro. And that Marlboro cut that conviction. Skull will cut that conviction too. Anything you ain't supposed to be doing will cut that conviction. It's the way Satan plans it. Paul might not let anybody know. But he recognized the Lord when the Lord started talking to him, which says to me he was already at least thinking, you know, I might be messing up here. That's logic. You can argue with me, and I, I won't fuss with you if you do. But in Acts 17, Paul sees a city wholly given to idolatry. To be honest with you, I think that describes any city I've ever been in these days. Because we worship the dollar. We worship a football team. We worship what they call football here, which we call soccer there. They worship baseball players. People worship... Cars. Cars, houses, beautiful women, beautiful men, whatever. People worship all sorts of things. First Corinthians tells us, I think it's chapter 10, that the Gentiles make sacrifices... They're making sacrifices to devils. They may not realize it. Maybe they're sacrificing to get that car. Maybe they're sacrificing to make Buddha happy. Maybe they're sacrificing to make, you know, the Pope happy. Maybe they're sacrificing to make all of these innumerable gods that the Hindus worship happy. But you're not worshiping Christ. The Bible says you're worshiping the devil. Paul gets to Athens. Athens, now Sparta, that's where the real men were. Athens is where the people that thought they knew everything were. Okay? As he walks up, they have a tomb to every god that they know of. And just in case they missed one, they have a tomb to the unknown god. And Paul says, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. You have a tomb to every, you have a, a, an idol to every god, a, a statue, a memorial, whatever, to every god. No wonder I can't find it. I'm in the wrong chapter, ain't it? <laughs> I perceive that in all things you are two superstitions. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship. So he saw them wholly given to idolatry. Then he saw the ignorant worshipers. I declare unto you. And he begins to preach. And he quotes... Uh, Heraclitus. So he let them know that he was a learned man. This is just not some country bumpkin. Mm -hmm. I know about as much as you do, but he did so, we might say, with tact. Mm -hmm. You get down to the end when he finished preaching. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, 
Others said, We will hear thee again on this matter. And so Paul departed from among them. Howbeit certain men clave unto him and believe. And then it begins to name. It's kind of funny. Damaris' name is in this chapter, and I didn't notice it until right now. It says right there, Among them, uh, which was Dionysius the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris with them. People question Jesus, they're going to question Philip Wayne Sibley. Mm -hmm. People question Jesus, they're going to question Shannon. They're going to question Logan. They're going to question John. They're going to question Otis. They're going to question them. We hope to see crowds. We have seen the crowd grow in the last months. And not everybody that comes, it saddens me, honestly. When we see anybody, I could name you right now, 10 people who have darkened this door for a time or two, some of them, I can think of one in particular that's been through the baptistry and, and hadn't been back. Uh, actually, that's not true. Neither of the ones I'm thinking of went through the baptistry, but uh, they professed to accept Christ and we hadn't seen them in a long time. Did they accept Christ? Two people know. Who knows? Them and, them and Jesus. That's right. I, I'm not their judge. They don't have to make me happy. But it saddens me as the pastor that they're not here. There's a couple other people. There was three or four people who told me 100% on Saturday they were going to be here Sunday. Sunday, one of them texted me and said, I'm sorry, this medical issue has come up and I'm not going to be able to make it. Please don't, please don't fire me as your friend. I will come another time. I'm like, absolutely, we understand some medical things happen. Another one didn't tell me. Until Monday, then we're in the bed with some form of depression. Okay, so I understand why they wasn't here. They're still sad. But we have to press forward. Hopefully nobody's coming to arrest us, but here's what we do. When Jesus is talking and preaching in John chapter 7, the Holy Spirit was a thing of the future as far as the indwelling Holy Spirit. But say amen, if you're here and you know you've been born again, say amen. 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 I believe every voice in the house. And you have the Holy Spirit. I have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit who says, say this. The Holy Spirit who says, invite that woman to the bakery, at the bakery to church. She told me she didn't speak any English, Phil. But when I gave her the track to invite her to church, because you know it's in German too, she said, are the services in English? <laughs> she just told me she didn't speak any English. I said, yes, ma'am, but I'll have a printed translation for you to follow along with. Now, I don't know if she'll come, but I invited her. There's some statistics. I'm coming in for a landing. I'm not telling you anything that you don't know. I have been preaching since I arrived in June. That is not the job of just a pastor, but of every person in the pew to tell people about Jesus and to invite people to church. I gave you a number early in the week that I wanted to see next week. That's based on another preacher I know who does research all the time. It would bore me to death to do it, but I enjoy reading it once he's completed it. <laughs> Churches that have, or churches of our size that are running 40 to 50, churches who have one or two visitors every week are treading water. Churches who have fewer than, have one or less a week, is backing up. Churches that have, churches of our size, the statistics are based on 100, so I'm cutting them roughly in half. The churches that are that are growing for our size have three to five visitors a week that are first talking about first time visitors. Churches that are going to grow exponentially for our size would have five to seven a week. So that falls on every one of us as we go forth to just invite people. Now, y'all live on base. I don't know how much you do in the community, 
But generally, when I'm standing in line, I've been more along a time or two, but generally, when I'm standing in line, I can tell from the people in front of me and behind me who's German, who's American. You can at least talk to the Americans and hand them a tract, invite them to church. I can't tell you what the Holy Spirit wants you to do. But this much I know. He wants us to tell other people and he wants to see his church grow. And he's not going to do some supernatural thing where magically we go from 40 to 140 overnight. But he's going to use Philip Wayne Sibley. He's going to use Cecile Sibley. He's going to use Sham. He's going to use Logan. He's going to use Otis. Do we want to reach the U.S. military? Absolutely. That's why I came here. Does the Great Commission say to reach the German next door? Absolutely. That's why I try to invite our neighbors anytime we have. I try to invite, I didn't invite this gentleman this week because I know he's older and most of the things we were inviting people to was for young people, were for young people. I should have invited him to Sunday and I failed to do so. Do you ever do that? Do you ever fail to do something? So what's the solution? I'm coming in for a landing. When... All of us have to be honest. At times, we know the Holy Spirit tells us to ask somebody to church or offer them a tract or whatever, and we fail to do it. What is the, What should be our response at that moment? Do we throw up our hands and quit? If not, what do we do? It's a little deeper to keep it on, keep it on. But that's very important. Persistence is important. The Bible speaks much about persistence. 1 John 1 9. Lord, I can't fix that. I messed up. You told me to give that person a track, and now I don't even know where they've gone. Lord, you told me to give that person a track, and the tracks are in the car. They're not in my pocket. They'll be gone before I can get back. I'm sorry. If you provide me the opportunity again, I'll be ready. When Tyson messes up, do you forgive him when he asks you to? Absolutely. You got grown kids. Kids that we could say ought to know better. Mm -hmm. When they mess up and they say, man, dad, I really messed it up. Do you encourage them or do you beat them further down? Mm -hmm. I got two grown boys. One of them recently really stepped in it. But I tried not to lecture him. Loved him. Pointed him to Jesus. And I continued to tell him how much I love him and how I'm proud of him. You messed up. Get it right with God. Get it right and roll on. That's all you can do. And that's what the, the Lord, he wants. To, that, that's the most, I said I was going to shut up and I promise I'm going to say this and I'm going to shut up. The most amazing thing in scripture beyond Christ died for us to me is the eyes of the Lord run to and fro. <clears throat> if we put that in English where we could understand it today, Logan, the eyes of the Lord are continually running to and fro forever, looking to prove himself strong on the behalf of them whose heart is perfect which does not mean without sin, Otis. It means completely stayed on him, whose heart is perfect toward him. He wants to prove himself strong in your life. He wants to prove himself strong in Michelle's life. He wants to prove himself strong in the preacher's life. We get tired. We get overwhelmed. We don't know what to do. We serve a God who does. Amen? Amen. Let's close in prayer right there. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for all that came out tonight. All that might be watching by the Facebook or who that might watch later, Lord. And we do ask you to just work in our lives, Lord. Show us somebody. Show each person here somebody they can invite to church before Sunday. And, Lord, we as a church ask you to give us three or four new visitors this week. And bring back some old ones, Lord. Young man told me yesterday he knew he needed to be here and he was working on it. Wake him up early Sunday, Lord. Give him no excuses that he can't come. We know his heart's in your hands. We ask you to work. 
We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.